Remember how Rutherford was always shooting little alpha particles at gold foil, and he was so surprised to see an alpha particle come out, hit the gold foil, and then come right back, and he concluded there must be a, a little bunch of really positive charge right there somewhere in the gold foil. Most of the time he missed it, but sometimes he didn't miss it. So I'm gonna propose this thing. It has plus ZE, that's the, oh man, what's that? Atomic number times the number of fundamental charges that it's got. This is a nucleus here. And I'm gonna fire something at my nucleus for the sake of making it a little bit simpler. I'm just gonna fire some plus Q at it. Maybe it'll be a fundamental charge or something. We'll see as we go in there. Yeah, I'll probably make it a fundamental charge. It, it's got some mass also, this charge that I'm firing at it. And I guess, uh, no, we don't need to make, we could just, we could say any charge at all. In fact, this could be a, um, it could be a helium atom or um, an alpha particle, um, you know, a helium atom stripped of the nuclei. So I want you to think about this guy coming in here with a certain velocity. It turns out that Rutherford was able to know how fast his alpha particles were going. And what he did next was he said, when will this particle stop if it's going to bounce back away that direction? And you know what's happening here. These two charges don't like each other. This guy comes in with some kinetic energy. Let's say that the kinetic energy initial is one half m v initial square. And then it ends, it finally stops moving when it's got a really big, really big potential energy. So then we could say, what letter do we use for potential energy? Oh yeah, U. U final will be, oh dang, I need to remember my electrostatic potential energy equation. I think that's KC times Q1 times Q2 over aura, the distance that, uh, <clears throat> well, what do I mean? I mean, I guess the distance between the two things. So here's the center right here. And I'm gonna say that this makes actually a bound on the size, look at this. This, the biggest this could possibly be is D, because I don't wanna think that this alpha particle can actually enter the nucleus. That's insane. He's not doing fusion, people. He's simply bouncing off like billiard balls. So here's what we got. We've got this, and we've got this, and I'm saying that when all of this turns into that, then we've got ourselves the size of the nucleus. Let's set it up. I'm gonna say that one half mv initial score is, well, what's this gonna be? It's gonna be kc, of course, and it's gonna be q, and it's gonna be ze on the other charge, and I'm gonna divide that by the distance between the two things, which I'm saying is the, what is it gonna be, the upper bound on the size of the nucleus, or the inner, the lower bound on the size of the nucleus? Of course, it is the largest size the nucleus can possibly be, and the faster I shoot them in, the better I can really measure this. So Let's solve this sucker for D and uh, see what we get. I guess I'm gonna get, well, I gotta get a KC here, right? And I'm gonna have a Z, and I'm gonna have whatever charge I sent in and the fundamental charge, so this is gonna be what, 2E or 7E or whatever we choose to send in. And then, oh, wait a second, do I have to multiply by two? I think I do, there's a two up top. And I'm going to be dividing by the mass that I sent in and dividing by the initial velocity, the thing I sent in. In fact, if you wanna just leave this as a one half down here, I don't usually recommend this, but it might be cute. This is the incoming energy, and that's sort of the, uh, kind of the outgoing energy divided by T, or multiplied by D, I mean. And uh, this <clears throat> is the ultimate limit on the size of a nucleus, and he found out that the size of a nucleus, he said, he said some limits on the size of a nucleus. What did he get? He got something like 3.2 times 10 to the 14th meters. Negative 14th meters. So we have to get this really cool unit. In fact, other people did this with other nuclei. What were they shooting at? Um, silicon, and then ultimately lots and lots of different things. And they found the following relationship. They found that the size of the nucleus, the radius of the nucleus, well, it certainly depends on the number of nucleons in the nucleus, but the strange thing, maybe you'll think it's strange, maybe you won't, it's some number to start off 1.2 times 10 to the negative 15th meters. That's where we start off, I guess that's the size of a single proton or something. And then it's A, that's the atomic mass, it's the atomic mass to the one third power. Now I want you to think about this for a little bit because I'm gonna ask you why.
That's what I'm really interested in. And frankly, I'm not gonna answer it. So you don't need to pause it. You need to try to figure out why the nucleus would depend on the one third power of the, oh, this could be the number of nucleons. The one third power. Kira, have you ever seen anything to the one third power before? Never. No, that's a beautiful thing. Figure out why. And then I will introduce a new unit. Remember we had this 1.2 times 10 to the negative 15th meters. I'm thinking that we should introduce a femptometer. One femptometer is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 15th meters. That's just so handy that it's an F right there because I'm gonna call it a Fermi after the great Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. They said about Enrico Fermi that while all his friends were standing around and quoting awesome things when he watched the atomic bomb go off, it was like, it was like this cool mushroom cloud and there was this other thing around it and it was like this. He was watching it and while they were saying cool things about how they were destroying the world and they maybe regretted what they were doing and it was awesome and powerful and scary and stuff, he picked up some paper and he was just standing here and he dropped little bits of paper and when the nuclear blast hit, the piece of paper went this direction because of the blast, and he calculated the energy of the blast in his head. Enrico Fermi, what a guy. All right, so it makes sense to honor him with some cool units. The next thing I wanna do is point out to you that a lot of nuclei are not stable. Not stable, what does that mean? I guess that means they will decay. Randomly. Randomly, a lot of nuclei will suddenly go to a more stable state, or at least leave an unstable state and go to a different state. There's no telling whether it'll be more stable or less stable. But I want to tell you why. I want to give you a feel for why. Let's think about a nucleus. A nucleus has some protons, and it has some neutrons, and I'll just draw those as circles. So this has, what am I going to do? I'm probably going to do six of these guys. And this has six protons, and so it's carbon, and I'm gonna give it six neutrons also, and so it's carbon-12, and that's what carbon-12 looks like, where it's this three-dimensional kind of oozy sphere because they don't really want to be any particular place when you measure them. Now, they're more massive than electrons, but still, they don't like to be pinned down because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I guess their momentum would get really big if you knew exactly where they were. Yuck, you do not wanna deal with that. Now, I will tell you that those protons do not like those other protons. If those protons are approximately, let's say that distance is just about 10 to the negative 15th meters, then we could calculate the force between those suckers. That electric force between those protons is a repulsive force, and it's Kc times the charge of one new uh, proton, uh, oh, and times the charge of another proton, divided by how far apart they are, uh-oh, squirt. So I'm about to take this in here, and I'm going to do Kc 8.99 times 10 to the ninth, something or something units. What are the kind of units it's got to have? It's got to have newtons, right? And it's got to have meters squared, and it's got to be divided by coulomb squared. And then I'm supposed to divide or multiply that by the fundamental charge squared, which is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, and I better square it. And then I'm supposed to divide by 1.0 times 10 to the negative 15th meters, and I better square that sucker also. This, try it, Try it, but it comes out to 230 newtons. Ding, do you have any idea, do you have any idea what a mass the size of a proton would do if it were acted on by 230 newtons? You would move if I acted on you with 230 newtons. Imagine something that it's a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of your mass. Let's find the acceleration. The acceleration then is going to be the force that's on it divided by the mass. And remember the mass is something like 10 to the negative 27th, that's a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a kilogram. You have got yourself an acceleration that is approximately 10 to the 29th meters per second squared. That is an absolutely enormous force between these protons, and they frankly hate each other. So if nothing else were going on, this nuclea, nucleus would split apart in a burst of awesome, and, well, nothing would really exist. It would be a really boring world. But instead, there must be another force, and that force must be really strong. So guess what we're going to call it? You ready? Here we go. What we're going to call this really strong force that must be holding the nucleus together? Leave it to physicists to have creative names. Later.